Well, we said you could ask us anything, and you did. And we'll have some answers coming up. Get ready for our candid answers to your questions, and we will be giving away two courses designed to help kids learn about how to handle money. We'll do that a little bit later in the video. But in case you don't know us, I'm Hope. And I'm Larry. And this is Under the Median, where every week we talk about practical frugality. We're going to get right into the questions, but first we have a couple of thank yous to give out. One of our viewers has been sending me beautiful jewelry <laughs> from paparazzi, and I don't know who it is, but thank you so much to whoever you are. So y'all are going to see some really great glammy like necklaces coming your way. <laughs> We'd like to also send a thank you out to Linda, who sent us this wonderful Puerto Rican dark roast coffee. We've been drinking it this week, and oh, is it ever good. Dark roast is my personal favorite. All right, so thanks to all of you who sent us some amazing things via the U.S. Postal Service. <laughs> all righty, now into the comments and the questions. MC's Envelopes wants to know, how do you handle budget weariness when you find you aren't progressing toward goals very fast? And this was actually a popular question. Several viewers asked this. Well, one of the things we talked about on a previous video was, now Hope and I have this problem too. We Absolutely. Have, we have run into the same <laughs> dilemma where it gets weary, you're not seeing a lot of progress, it doesn't look like anything's happening. But our recommendation is, Take a look back from where you started and where you're at right now, and I think you'll see that you've made a lot more progress than you thought you have. Question number two, Anna would like to know, this is a question for me, how have you managed to do everything you've done and still remain sane? Well, um, I haven't always <laughs> remained sane. Uh, we have like a firm agreement between the two of us. This is a real thing, y'all. <laughs> We have agreed that only one of us can lose it at one time. So if I'm the one that is going, having a meltdown, then the rule is he's got to remain calm to be able to like talk me off an emotional cliff and vice versa, but we can't both lose it at the same time. It's a rule. We've always stuck to it. And I'll have to say, when I see hope is just really overloaded, I look for ways to take the edge off and try to come in and do something that I can do to help her out. And he's learned to do what he can to help me out without trying to let me know he's trying to solve my problems. I'm just saying, most of the time when we ladies are having a meltdown, it's because we just want our husbands to go, oh, honey, it'll be okay. We don't want a problem solved. We just want compassion and empathy. So he's learned that over the years, but then he goes around behind the scenes and like does nice little things to try to like take some of my load off of me. Kim asks, what do you do when one person is frugal and into preparedness, a prepper, <laughs> for the security of the family and the other half does not support them? My husband thinks I'm nuts. Well, Hope and I, for one, we're not marriage counselors, so we're not going to try to give you marriage counseling, but here's what we do. We try to work in agreement, mm -hmm. and if Hope and I are not in agreement on, let's say, how much to prep for, well, let's just say, toilet paper, for instance, if I think we need five rolls and she thinks we only need two, then we try to just work out on where we can hit common ground, and my suggestion would be look for areas of agreement with your spouse and kind of go easy on it. If you, if you go easy, chances are things will go a lot better and who knows, you might be able to, over time, convince him. One of the things we've also learned is that it's not like an automatic when I say, so I think we should do this way cool thing. And when you're enthused about something, it's really hard not to bowl your spouse or your partner <laughs> over with, hey, we should do this way cool thing. Because to you, it's like this spark of genius. And you're like, yeah, this is awesome, isn't it? And when your partner is like, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. It's very, it feels very defeating. It feels like they're sort of coming against you and you take it a little personally, right? Uh, one of the things we've learned is to say, we're going to tie a knot here and we're going to come back to it. Uh -huh. We might have multiple conversations before we finally come to the point where he gives a little, I give a little, and eventually we do wind up with some nice place in the middle where we're going to buy, let's say the toilet paper example, a certain amount of toilet paper and feel okay about it. But the other thing we do is we say, this may be open for discussion again in the future. 
and we might agree in three months or two months if we find that's not enough toilet paper or we're feeling uncomfortable about that. It's just an example, guys. I know, don't go in the comment section and say you don't need toilet paper, all right? We yeah, always, that's, that's we just always an have example. this conversation. It's an example. Yeah, um, yeah. Then we know we might come back to that discussion another three months and say, how are we feeling about this? Do we need to like up the amount we're saving of that specific item in our preparedness pantry? The main thing is Hope and I try to walk in agreement with what we're doing. We, we agree on taking a course of action, then we do it. All right, next question. Lori, um, and there were actually several questions about this same topic, I will say. Um, Y'all want to know what we do for a frugal and fun <laughs> date night. Okay, first of all, I'm going to tell you that we actually have a free ebook. I'm just going to slide that right in there. It's a 60 fun things you can do with your family that don't cost any money. I'm going to make sure there's a link to that resource in the description of this video. And within that ebook are 20 fun date night ideas, really <laughs> fun ideas. One of the things we discovered when you don't have money, you got to be a little creative and just spending time together for us has just been gold just mm -hmm. to be able to be together and to sort of live life together. So, I mean, when the kids were young, honestly, having mom and dad watch the kids for an hour while we went to the grocery store, that, that counted as our date night. I know, not a really fun date night, mm -hmm. but just getting out together and not feeling that need to spend a lot of money. We might go for a walk. We might go take a picnic to the park. We might do something like that. Um, we also found a lot of low cost things we could do. It cost us a little bit of money. Like we loved antique. Um, we collected antiques, still do a little bit, I guess. And we would go to an antique fair and take our lunch. But instead of just taking our lunch, no, it wasn't just a sack lunch. We would take a square folding table and a really nice antique tablecloth and take some of our antique dishes and we would put those out on the table and have our lunch sitting at the edge of the parking lot uh -huh. having this feast on this really fun fancy looking feast and people either walked by and you know looked like that's really fun or they looked at us like we were crazy and we were okay one way or the other it didn't bother us because we were just in the moment together and you know a, a date night for us it, i don't think this looks real romantic but a date night for us might be the kids are upstairs they're on their computers they're doing things with their friends online we'll be down here and just we'll just watch a movie together we'll sit on the couch together we'll cuddle you know i i talk we talk affectionately to each other we, <laughs> we get coffee we get some popcorn have some snacks and really and i'll get done with the night and i'll say hope i really enjoyed spending the night with you and and I think that's kind of where our date nights are we'd like to go out and do things too but honestly it's what you do in the moment that I think really counts we've done a lot of getting together with friends too yeah. I mean but not to go out to eat like like to have potlucks together with friends or just to have dessert or have coffee or have game night stuff like that we've mm -hmm. we've done a lot of getting together with friends without going out to restaurants Yep. All right. Next question. Suggestions for good supplements for a vegan. Um, how do you decide what to get? All right. We've been vegan for 10 years. Two supplements, guys, that we always take in a third. We sometimes kind of throw in during cold and flu season. All right. Vitamin B12, vitamin D, especially if you're not able to get outside and be in the sunlight for at least 30 minutes a day. And then when we feel like it's cold or flu season, we might throw some vitamin C in it. That is it. Mm -hmm. That's all the supplements we take. Kyle and Michelle ask, how can you be more frugal while mm. still buying organic? Ways to keep your organic budget simple. Okay, one of the things we did, the Environmental Working Group always puts together their dirty dozen. I think it might be even more than a dozen now. It might be like the dirty 25 or something, but it's the top um, 20, 25 fruits and vegetables that are heavily sprayed and have the most residue in them. Um, of chemicals. Uh, those were the ones that we always tried to focus on. You got to like pick your battles. What is the most important thing to you? Spinach, for instance, is always on the dirty dozen. So we always tried to buy organic spinach whenever possible. The other thing you have to decide is where you're going to draw those lines. In the United States, to be certified organic, the farmers have to prove that there's no chance of overspray from a farmland that is surrounding their farmland, that those farms do use chemicals, even though the farmers are no spray and don't. 
And uh, here in Illinois, that's becoming increasingly difficult to prove. And it's also a very expensive process. So we always went to farmer's markets and looked for the farmers that were no spray. Mm -hmm. And for us, that kind of became the benchmark rather than organic. We decided no spray was probably gonna work for us and we were okay with this. And th that's what we focused on. Also a little less expensive than certified organic. Yvette asked, what does Larry do for a living? Well, let's, let's just take that question. Okay. It's no secret what I do. I've been doing it for a long time. I'm a property room technician. I work for our local police department. I handle with two other people the, all the evidence, found property, lost and found items that come in, uh, things that we get ready for court, we get ready uh, for to take uh, stuff to the lab or, or for investigations, but I work with the Peoria Police. I've been doing that now on that particular job for 17 years, and I'm getting ready to retire in December. So looking forward to that. It's a job that I greatly enjoy doing. Uh, Yvette also would like to know, what's your favorite special occasion meal? All right, this is it. Hold on to your hats. <laughs> When we decide, like, we don't eat a lot of junk food. You've probably already figured that out by now. But if we're going to have a date night and we're going to eat, like, something that is for Enjoy us enjoyable, enjoyable yeah. we are going to go to Aldi and we are going to buy straight up processed vegan junk food <laughs> and bring it home. And Larry might throw in a little bit of ale because that's like his thing from Aldi. If he can get a little bit of dark ale, have a bottle of that to him. That's like, that is the premium experience for like a special occasion date night meal is going to be that. Southern girl, y'all, asks, I'm completely <laughs> debt free. Good for you. I pay for my home and car insurance and was wondering if it would be beneficial to drop some of the coverage and raise deductibles. Well, that really is entirely up to you and how much you're comfortable taking a risk. Mm -hmm. If you have a pretty new car and car prices are so expensive right now, I would consider keeping full coverage, especially the way our drivers are these days. Uh, we have two cars, one's a 2014, one's a 2015, and right now we're maintaining full coverage. One has 80,000 miles and the other has 78,000 miles. But the idea is, can you readily replace that vehicle from your bank account without feeling a yeah. severe pinch. So that, that's something you have to consider. So really, it's mm -hmm. kind of up to you what you're comfortable doing. Caroline would like to know, when Larry's paycheck first comes in, what's your process for dividing it up into your budget, expected monthly expenses, sinking funds, et cetera? Um, we treat, he gets paid biweekly, and we really treat um, his paychecks as though they were one paycheck. We budget monthly. Now, the reason we're able to do that is because we have enough money sitting in the bank that we can, you know, pay from, from one paycheck. If it's a little over that, it doesn't matter because we mm -hmm. know it's going to balance out with the next paycheck. Now, when the kids were young and it was a lot tighter, then we probably did pay a lot of attention to, you know, which bill is due with paycheck one, which bills do we pay with paycheck two. That was probably a lot more regimented, but we haven't been as regimented with dividing mm -hmm. the paychecks up uh, directly as soon as they come in for a long time. Really, for us, it's more of a monthly type budgeting process. Yeah. Do you and Larry meet monthly as a couple mm -hmm. to discuss expected expenses for the month? And the answer is we do meet regularly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we meet bi-weekly, sometimes we meet monthly, sometimes it's longer. It all depends. And it might depend on what mm -hmm. part of our budget we're concerned with mm -hmm. and that needs attention. So Hope keeps a very close rein on the budget. And if she has a question, we get together and we discuss it and see what we can do to make adjustments when needed. Sherry Ellison would like to know, uh, have you seen the new security cameras that screw into a standard light socket so there's no battery required. I ordered three of these and she's kind of wondering like how well do they work and how much energy do they use? Um, Sherry, I'm not 
familiar with those until this afternoon. So I started looking into them. I looked on Amazon. I looked at what kind they mm -hmm. offer, what the price is. They, they run around $40 per camera that mm -hmm. screw into a light bulb. And with an app, they seem to do quite a bit. You can actually change the position of the camera. Oh. Uh, if, you, if you have your phone app and you're at work and you want to look at a certain portion of the house, you can. It'll record onto a little SD card, or you can send it up to the cloud. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they do have some advantages. Um, so as far as how much power they use, I can't determine how much they use. I don't see anywhere where anyone's listed yeah. the amount of power that they draw. They do have a light on that works at night. It's going to use a little bit more with that, but they're LEDs. So really, I don't think power draw is going to be a big issue with those. So uh, I would say uh, give them a try and see how they work and let us know. Okay, Jennifer, she's new to our channel. Welcome, Jennifer. She would like to know how long has your family been meatless and was an adjustment for your children? 10 years and our younger kids, let's see, uh, the two that are still at home are 18 and 14. So for the most part, they barely remember even having meat in the house. Daniel, as those of you who have watched the channel for any length of time know our son, Daniel, who's 18, is uh, definitely my sidekick and sous chef. And uh, he's only learned to cook vegan. He has literally no idea how to cook meat. He wouldn't have a clue. As far as our older boys are concerned, they do not follow the vegan lifestyle, and that's fine. They're, they're doing what they, they feel is best for them. However, our second son, uh, John, is dating very seriously a, a woman who is vegan, so we feel like there is vegan in his future. <laughs> Lauren would like to know, I'd love your tips and wisdom on homeschooling on a budget. This is our first year. Welcome to Homeschooling, Lauren. <laughs> for us, this is year number 20. Three, and we have two more years to go. Lauren, the most important thing that you want to do is figure out which subjects you can teach corporately to your children, which are at different levels academically. So for instance, we only bought one curriculum each year for science and one curriculum each year for history. And then we just presented that same material to each of our students at different levels. They were all together in one room. We studied it together. And the process projects that they produced to show me what they had learned were at their specific age and grade level. Hey, just a reminder, this question actually on homeschooling curriculum, I want to put a little plug in here. Make sure you stick with us because we are giving away two complete courses from Matt Matheson and Family Money School. We'll do that just a little bit later in this video. And those courses teach children how to handle money. And while you're at it, can you do us one more thing while we're talking about favors? If you're finding this video really fun and interesting, make sure you hit the like button, will you? That helps us with the YouTube algorithm. Now, back to our questions. Okay, Lisa says, Thank you for your channel. You are a blessing. Well, thank you, Lisa. What do you spend monthly on non-food? Razors, toothpaste, toilet paper, shampoo, cleaners, makeup, etc. Where do you shop for those items and do you stockpile them or buy them as needed? Well, I can tell you, Lisa, I don't buy too many razors right now. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The answer, Lisa, to your question is I allow $50 for all of those items combined. I just call them household items and they all go into one category in the budget. I rarely rarely actually spend that whole $50. I probably should reevaluate that am amount of money. It probably should be less, but that's what it's been for years. So I just keep it at $50 a month. And no, I'm probably never going to spend that much money. I like to wait for 20% off days at big lots and then go and stock up. I only stock up on what will actually retain its quality yeah. uh, for longer term storage. But a lot of this kind of stuff will. So we keep enough for probably mm, three, four, five months, maybe like as far as like toothpaste and soap and things like that are concerned up to five or six months. Corrine Jordan asks, have you always allowed forgiving in your budget? What has practical frugality brought to or enhanced in your relationship? Well, let's take the first question. Hope and I feel that giving is very important, and we actually have a budget category for that. Mm -hmm. We used to send money to a good friend of ours who was a widow, and still is, mm -hmm. and just to give her a little help, and she was she's just such a wonderful, good friend. 
we might use that money to help out a special need that comes up. And usually it's people that we know. We, uh, we have given to some organizations, but, uh, but yes, we feel that giving is very important. And of course, we give uh, a tithe to our church out of the budget all the time. That's the most important thing that comes right off the top. Now, the other thing that we did was when the kids were young and we really didn't have a lot of money, we would give to people um, in different ways that didn't cost a lot of money. Volunteering for local organizations, super important way to give of your time to help those who are less fortunate. We really feel like this whole idea of giving, it's helpful to you, even if you feel like you are trying to make it from one paycheck to the next, because it helps you remember that, first of all, to be grateful for what you do have, and secondly, that there are other people out there that are having a really, really rough time too, and it allows you to minister to them. We actually have a program uh, coming up in November. We're going to address this and we're going to give you all kinds of different ways and ideas that you can give to others. And the other question, what has practical frugality brought or enhanced in your relationship? Well, it's caused Hope and I to have to really work very closely together, (laughs) be on the same team and be going the same direction on it. So I, I would say it's brought us closer together as a couple. Corinne would also like to know, have other family and friends been curious or inspired to follow your example? I think we've been a curiosity to them, yes, but I'm not sure that we've been an inspiration to them. No, no, we really haven't. They, they live the way uh, they can afford to live and we do what we can do. <laughs> However, our immediate family, our kids are raised boys are living the way they were raised, pretty much. They're living a very frugal and and, uh, financially responsible lifestyle. All right. And the last thing she wants to know, Corinne wants to know, if there's one thing you could have and money was no object, what would it be? We have very different thoughts on this. (laughs) Okay. Uh, I would definitely rip up our back patio and I would put in a sunroom and that would not be Larry's plan. No, my I am very practical and very level-headed when it comes. Oh yeah, no, no, I'm not saying that's not practical, but I just want to, I just want to load mine up a little bit. This is his level-headed. Yeah, this Go is ahead. very practical and level-headed. I would get a convertible Mazda Miata if I had just no, no sense of responsibility financially at all. I definitely would get one. It would have to be our third car. It would have to sit outside, or maybe we could adjusted. But that's what I would get. I would get uh, probably an older model. Uh, I think they're fun. Tanya has an energy question. Now, this actually came up because we just did a video that showed you how we dropped our electric usage and our uh, utility bill by 50% in six weeks. In case you haven't watched it, I'm going to make sure that that video is linked up above and in the description of this video. But based on that video, uh, here's what Tanya would like to know. Let's say that you have the windows open. It's going to be hot. Should you wait to turn on the AC? For example, your thermostat is set for 74, but the temperature inside is 79. Will a few degrees make the system work harder and take Mm -hmm. more energy, or should I turn it on sooner? I I wouldn't let your your home heat up too much beyond where you normally keep it with the AC on. The the hotter your house is, the more your AC is going to have to work to to bring it down. So it will be working full time until it trips off after it goes slightly below 74 degrees where your thermostat set. What I would do, if you're going to have your windows Mm -hmm. open, open them up in the early morning hours, bring in that cool air, let that fill your house, and then shut your windows as it starts to warm up. Kick your air on then. If your house is cooler than your thermostat, it won't even kick on right away. It's much easier for your AC to maintain a temperature than to bring your home down to the set temperature. Uh, The other thing that you want to consider is the relative humidity. So for us, that is always the breaking point. Mm -hmm. Because in Illinois, it's not just that it's going to get hot outside, it's that it's going to get humid outside. And for us, that is always the point where we say, we Mm -hmm. we give it up, we're going to turn on the AC. But of course, you know, as far as your budget is concerned, keeping the AC off as long as possible is, is super important. Yeah. Mrs. Budget Mom asks, I want to know how you do frugal Christmas. Gifts, no gifts. 
Well, we did a video on this. Actually, I think we did it last December, or it was maybe it was in November, but we did a video. We'll link that video so you can find it. Um, just in a nutshell, we cut our giving down mostly to our immediate family, and we, we get them pretty reasonable things. We buy a lot of used things, used books, used items. Uh, we only give a few gifts to close friends and just the immediate family. That's what we did. We do give like teacher gifts, things like that. Our kids are in a homeschool co-op, so all of those instructors get gifts. We do a lot of DIY for people that are outside mm -hmm. the immediate family. We might put together little gift baskets or things like that. We look for uh, times throughout the year when we can find items that will go really great in gift baskets, and we've set those aside, and then we put the gift baskets together when it gets closer to Christmas time. So that helps keep the cost low. And Hope has a set budget amount for Christmas gifts. I forget what it is, but you 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 might want to just set a certain amount mm -hmm. and then stick to it. Buy some gifts other times of the year. Start buying the gifts right after the first of the year when mm -hmm. you can get close out items. Lots of ideas. Silver Dreams asks, how much was the cost of your current home and how long did it take you to pay it off? Well, our current home, it's a three bedroom, it's brick, uh, it's uh, 2,400 square foot, it's in a very nice area, part of Peoria. We paid $120,000 for it. I know in some markets that's going to seem like a really cheap home, but Peoria is typically a very low cost housing market. It's way below the national average. So if you live in California or like Colorado Springs, Colorado, those this house would sell, it could sell for no, way north of 450,000 if it were in some of those areas. We did not take any time to pay it off. We paid cash for this house by saving up over a long period of time while we lived in our other home, which was paid off in five years. Mm -hmm. How much were you making annually at the time you bought your home? We were making a little over 40K when we bought the house. David Maxey would like to know, do you have a veggie or herb garden? I've done really well growing herbs. In fact, one of our viewers sent me herb uh, seeds that she had seed saved for me. Um, herbs seem to like, because they don't seem to take the amount of care <laughs> that <laughs> vegetables do. I've not done well with vegetables. I would love to do better with a vegetable garden, but we do always have a few herbs on hand. Angela asks, I am currently working part-time to care for my mother-in-law mother mm -hmm. and my husband works full-time. Mm -hmm. I would like to put some money aside for savings from my income. How much should I be putting? Also, any advice on fixing a car on a budget? Okay, well, I will take the how much should you be setting aside question. I'll throw the car uh, budget uh, thing to Larry. Uh, Angela, it depends on what your goals are. That's the honest answer. You need to figure out, well, here's what happens. If you think, how much should I be setting aside? What portion of this? You're gonna wind up with one great big huge pile of money with like no name on it, with no purpose. You need to make sure that when you are saving, that there's a purpose for the money that you are saving. So make mm -hmm. sure you have that prioritized list of goals always written out, always on hand, and you know not only how much money you're saving, but what you're saving it for, why, and what your time frame is to reach that goal. That will give you the answer that you need. That's the amount of money you should be setting aside. As far as fixing a car on a budget, Hope and I have a sinking fund for the car mm -hmm. repairs. Now, we own two cars that really don't require a lot of maintenance. That's mm -hmm. something that I take into consideration when I'm buying a car. There's, there's a few brands out there that are just notoriously reliable. And, and so that's the first thing I, I look for, a reliable car. I think our budget is, what is it, $1,200 a year mm -hmm. for car, car repairs. repairs? It doesn't take much to get up to that either. No, a major repair on a car today it can really go very north of $1,000 mm -hmm. quickly. You know, if you're talking about fixing brakes, uh, just about anything. It's very expensive. Car repairs are hugely expensive. Mm -hmm. If you have an older car, you're going to need to figure some more money in your budget. And I would suggest setting up mm -hmm. a sinking uh, fund for that. And go by how much did you... How much did your car cost you last year? Look at your amounts mm -hmm. that you spent on it and budget accordingly. Richard wants to know, of the 50 states, what made you choose Illinois to call home? Because <laughs> Illinois was always home. We were both born yeah. and raised in this area. Larry's parents were always here. They've passed on now. My mother is still here 
And so we chose to stick around Illinois. You know, a better question might be, why do we stay in Illinois? <laughs> and, and We're kind of wondering that now, I'm just saying. <laughs> and, and there really is a good reason. You know, uh, this is home. I really can't imagine living anywhere else. We've been here all of our lives. I've lived in this same town mm -hmm. for 65 years. We're not likely to move out of here. All of our friends are here, our, our church, our family. We're well established. Mm -hmm. uh, I kind of think we're going to spend the rest of our lives right here. Mary wants to know, uh, can we do a no spend October? And uh, she would love for the channel to do that. I'm open to it, guys. Tell us in the comments section. Do you want us to kind of do some things with a no spend October, give you no spend uh, ideas? Mary is specifically thinking of stockpiling some money she's saving between now and say Thanksgiving to set aside for Christmas. If y'all want to do it, we'll do it. Tell us in the comments section. And uh, if enough of you want to do it, then yep, we'll do that. Vegan questions. <laughs> These are always popular on the Q&A. All mm -hmm. right. Uh, Y'all want to know, why did we go vegan? And was it hard to go vegan? And um, was the choice for health, allergies, or moral reasons? It was health. My father died uh, of a massive coronary at the age of 47. And when I was about that age, I started doing a lot of reading and a lot of research on the link between what we eat and heart disease. And there is a, a huge, huge link between being vegan and being able to keep your heart healthy. So we just gave up meat. Hmm. And, and was it hard? Uh, meat was not as hard for us as dairy. Dairy was, I mean, it was really, really hard to give up dairy. I, I think hard. once you get into the the habit of eating mm -hmm. vegan, it's really easy to stay there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I've mentioned this before, Hope does a great job of cooking oh, vegan meals. And when we eat vegan, we eat very tasty meals. And I, I tell you, a video that really helped us can do, make the complete switch was forks over knives mm -hmm. and the China study that what, what are the two doctors named? Yeah, uh, Campbell the, and Ethelston. Okay, and uh, well, I tell you what, they are very healthy people in their older mm -hmm. age. They're doing great. So uh, I would consider uh, having you watch that movie if you're if yeah. you have any doubts about whether vegan is good or not. Honey Fox Living wants to know: Is YouTube our main job? And the answer is yes, it is now. Believe it or not, we spend about 35 hours a week to put these two videos together. That includes the amount of time it takes me to do research and reading and scripting and recording and editing. And that doesn't include the rest of the time. Remember, we have a website, we have eBooks that we sell on the website. And so all of that takes me, that's an, time in addition to that 35 hours a week we spend on YouTube. So YouTube has been an incredible blessing to our family. We didn't start the channel thinking that we would make money, but uh, then we did start making money and it's um, allowing us to supplement uh, our uh, income in Larry's retirement and to make it possible for him to retire. And at the same time, I am currently working full time. So yeah. so th this is kind of all we do. We, we I work and I come home and we do videos. <laughs> so it does take a lot of time to put these together, but we enjoy sharing with you guys. All right, don't go away. We have some more really great questions and answers <laughs> coming your way. But we want to take a really short break and do that giveaway. Matt Matheson from Family Money School was gracious enough to donate two of his premium courses that help children learn how to responsibly handle money. And uh, he got on Zoom with us and did the drawing for the two winners. Let's see who won. So my name's Matt Matheson. And I am the uh, creator of Family Money School, which is a site that is designed to help uh, parents uh, raise kids who are money rock stars. And so the giveaway is for uh, both of my premium courses, uh, Ultimate Family Money School. So there's a course in there for kids that are 12 and under. Uh, that's a parent-directed course that'll help parents walk, uh, teaching their kids uh, all about money. And then Money Genius Academy, which is my uh, self-directed course for teenagers. So yeah, I'm pumped too to, uh, to do the giveaway here. And I can't wait to, uh, to see who the winners are. So our viewers know, I actually looked at both courses and I was so excited at what Matt was doing. This is incredibly engaging material to teach kids all about money management. So excited. All right, Matt. So we received well over a hundred entries and you are going to put it in the random number generator and pick two winners. 
Yeah, okay, let's go here. Let's see. So our first winner is uh, Stacy. So uh, Stacy, congratulations. You are the first winner of, uh, of the Ultimate Family Money School. And then the second, second winner is uh, Melissa. Melissa, um, and maybe I should say where they're from. Maybe that would be helpful so that they know that they're the winner. So uh, Melissa from Chicago, you are the first winner. And Stacy, you are from Washington. Uh, so congratulations to, to both of you. So what I will do is I have your email. So I will send you both out. Um, the uh, free access to the course. Uh, and I'll do that right away here. And you guys can dive right in. If you have any questions or anything, feel free to reach out and, uh, and ask me. And just in case the viewers are watching, they missed the giveaway. They're like, what's going on? If you want to know more about Matt's programs that teach kids about money management, Matt, your website is? Yeah, my website is familymoneyschool.com. So you can hop over there, lots of information. You can check, uh, check things out. Uh, my courses are all there. I've got, uh, my blog is there as well. You can check out my, uh, my YouTube channel. Um, I'd love to, uh, love to chat more with you. Yeah, and he has a lot of freebies over there, guys. So it's well <laughs> worth going and taking a look at his website. We'll make sure, by the way, guys, that there's also a link to his website in the description of this video. Matt, thanks so much for partnering with us to do this. Yeah. Game. Thank you so much, Hope and Larry. I really appreciate it. All right. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Talk soon. Bye. Well, we want to thank Matt Matheson so much for doing that. Uh, it's a, just a, a wonderful thing to offer these courses for you. And it'll be a benefit to your children to have that money habit down, how to handle money. It's a very important thing. It's not taught in most of our schools today. Well, Nunya Business would like to ask, well, I might be buying a house soon with hardly any down payment. Advice to first-time home buyers. Things beyond what's e easily Googled. Nanya, well, first of all, you need to make sure that you can handle that monthly payment and you can handle it easily. Pay no attention to what the bank is telling you that they are going to loan you. Mm -hmm. You need to reduce that substantially to what you are comfortable with them loaning you. And that might be quite a bit less than they are willing to loan you. Yeah, they will house strap you if you go by their amount. Absolutely. Now, the next thing is location, location, <laughs> location. You want to make sure that you are really comfortable. Go to that neighborhood. Walk around in the evening hours. See if there's a lot of families out doing family activities. See if there's a lot of people walking, hiking, that kind of thing. Those are all signs of a really, really healthy neighborhood. But make sure you're going to be comfortable long long term in that neighborhood before yeah. you buy. We actually did a whole video for first time home buyers and uh, we gave lots of tips and strategies that we used when we were looking for a home. We'll make sure that video, you can watch it. We'll link it up above for you, all right? And end of the description of the video. Kayla wants to know, how do you save money on kids' clothes and food? Kids' clothes, we used a lot of hand-me-downs and uh, we also bought secondhand, nearly anything. Except, I will say, if you shop end of the season clearance, you can score brand new clothing for somewhere between 75 and 90% off the original price tag. And we did do some of that. Um, food. All right. So for food, you need to figure out what's going to fill them up and what's going to be cheap. And we always offered if they got a little bit, you know, hungry later in the evening, they knew they could make themselves, for instance, a peanut butter sandwich or something like that. And that was allowed. But we definitely had one main dish. We would serve several inexpensive, low price side dishes. So they could always fill up on side dishes too, if they wanted to. And uh, we always serve popcorn, mid-morning snack, popcorn always popcorn. Cheap, 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 cheap. Carolyn says, I love watching your channel and I especially like the video when you featured your boys on it and they talked about what it was like growing up. 
I have a little one who is seven, and my husband and I are working on teaching him about money and savings. That is excellent. Is there any advice that you can offer on that? Well, just one thing that comes to mind is I would include your seven-year-old on some of the decisions that you and your husband are making about spending money. You might include him a little bit on what you do to research when you're purchasing something. What kind of things do you take into consideration? Like brand names, good reliable items that you're looking at buying. Include him on on the idea of, well, how much, how much will money buy? The value of money is very important. I think a lot of young people do not understand the value of money today. Now, we would say include him on the decisions. Your seven-year-old isn't going to determine what make and model of car you no, buy because no, 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 no. they're going to pick a Corvette or something like that. I'm just saying. So, <laughs> But what the, you are going to give them options on are when you're shopping for, let's say, back to school say, oh, look at these two shirts. They cost the same amount. Would you like the blue shirt or would you like the green shirt? Or we have enough for two of these shirts, but only one of these shirts. Which would you like to buy? Let them have part of the decision-making mm -hmm. process. And then even if you would prefer they got the blue shirt, if they choose the, the green <laughs> shirt, let them buy it and let them wear it. Giving them choices and tying those choices directly to money, super duper important. The other thing we tell parents all the time is your kids are not gonna understand money by osmosis. They're not gonna watch you do it and then just go, yes, I get it. You have to do a lot. And I do mm -hmm. mean a lot of talking to your kids about money about it will, what it will buy, what it will not buy, about principles as far as handling money yeah. and walk them through it step by step in an age appropriate manner. To get the lowdown on how our sons <laughs> felt about being raised frugal, we have a video that we did last month. It was our Q&A. And you can watch that video right over there. And you'll find out also the number one frugal habit that I did that drove them nuts. <laughs> watch the video and find out. <laughs> <laughs>